We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I am Catherine, that's Emily, and we are going to Italy. We are, we are back to European races, which means I have to wake up really early in the morning for Formula One now. Yay, Yay. we're going to Europe. Yeah, so Europe, Europe, Europe is, is fun. I, I love the, these European races, though. Like, yes, I have to wake up really early, but fun historic tracks, good historic racing. So it's, yeah, it's kind of say, a win. I would say overall, we have really solid racing in in Europe. Wonderful. Anyway, um, before we dive in, I wanted to add an addendum to our um from the dms episode from earlier this week last week whatever in in the not too distant past of um our our long-standing discussions of how to make the sprints a better and b relevant um and my dad figured out how to make it relevant like outside of the you know the issues with the format he he actually figured out something and a great incentive to make the sprints actually matter and actually be relevant what is it tell me i'm so intrigued bonus wind tunnel time I mean, well, that's what I was saying. Like, make it its own championship and throw money at it. Like, if you throw money at anything, it's worth it. So, I mean, obviously, yeah. money is good, but I think like wind tunnel time is something that's incredibly coveted, especially you know, for those of you who don't know, the higher up you finish in the constructors' standings, the less wind tunnel time you get allocated to you in the off season. So, you know, the whoever finishes P10 gets the most wind, wind tunnel time and the you know, the team that finishes P1, Red Bull, gets the least. Yeah. So, and that's and wind tunnels all help with aerodynamics and understanding how the car will drive and things like that. So, it's, it is a very important thing. It's like one of the more critical factors to car development is, you know, that that's why teams are so public about building their own wind tunnels um and like making such a big deal you know mclaren just opened one recently i think aston martin either is has or will one. have is building yeah. one yeah aston martin has been working on on their technology campus for you know the last few years it's been you know one of the cornerstones of, of their you know long-term development and they've been making a lot of big strides honestly like i know this is super random but i feel like aston martin is really just like digging in and investing and like daddy stroll will not stop until they're you know one of the top teams competing for championships I just, i've seen a it. lot of investment and like a lot of dedication to the cause with you know hiring people away from other teams and yeah throwing money at anything so um yeah i don't know i mean i like it you know, can, you know, considering the the long history of of you know what that team was and their start as Force India, which we really need to do that F one hundred one about you okay. know what happened to Force India one of these days, um, and then turning into Racing Point and you know going into administration and all of that, um, it like it's for, you know going from where they were to where they are now, even the, as they are a work in progress, it's still. I think it's really cool and really fascinating. And I, I don't necessarily think that it's something that you see as commonly now in motorsport. Yeah. I just, I honestly think though, the next big investment they need to make is into a second driver behind Alonzo. And I don't think they'll get rid of Lance. But I, I also agree. think Daddy Stroll is super cutthroat and like eventually we'll get rid of him. I don't know. Well, you know, as, as, as we, as we saw in the, the beginning episodes of this past season of drive to survive, he loves his son very much. He does. So I think, I think Lance might be daddy strolls big blind spot in his, you know, motorsport Which is fine. life. He's a dad. Um, but, but, but I, I also think that one of the best, you know, I, I think that one of the best serving things for Aston Martin to do is to move away from Lance Stroll, um, which I think we could potentially see once Honda comes over. Cause I do think that, you know, Honda not taking Yuki Tsunoda with, with them just, I, I can't see that not happening. And, and I can't now see... I want to see Yuki and Alonzo drive together. Right. Right. I I just can't see Yuki staying at, you know, in the Red Bull family cuz he's not going to look, I'm he's not going to drive for Red Bull. No. I don't think he's going to drive for Red Bull. And, like, and like I I yes, don't think it's in in the stars. Right. And yes, he's like in the Red Bull family, but he's he is the Honda 
stepchild. You know what I mean? Like, he's in the family, but he's more Honda than I mean, Red Bull. Yeah, I mean, he, he has those very close ties, ties to Honda, but I, I really think that even if he didn't, he still would be, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh man down on the totem pole for an available Red Bull seat. Yeah, and I don't think you can drive for V-Carb forever. Like, that's a that's a springboard team. It's not where you spend your entire career. That said, I think Pierre Gasly's missing it. <laughs> well, speaking of seats and yes. teams, guys, we are back to Emily's favorite part of the podcast, which is contracts. Yeah. Um, so news came out today that Alex Albon has signed a multi-year extension staying with Williams uh, through 2027. So this would take allegedly, the, allegedly. Um, but this is through the new regulations as well. So we would officially get into like the full new regulations with JV, our favorite person in F1. Um, I, okay. I'm torn. Yes. And I'm sure you are too. Like, I'm very glad that we'll see Alex around for several more years, but I want him in a better car. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. Like this is this is a guy, and it's really hard to, you know, conceptualize. Remember that Alex Albon drove for Red Bull, um, and he drove well for Red Bull. Um, and had Sergio Perez not been available, he'd probably still be at Red Bull. Um, so, you know, I think that this was the 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 smart choice. This was the the choice that everyone expected. You know, he could have been a dark horse and, and, you know, really thrown silly season, you know, for a loop going somewhere else. But I do think that it it's, you know, not surprising at all that Williams wants to keep him and also wants to keep him long-term. Right. Exactly. And I mean, James has really preached like growing within the team and building up within the team. Like that's why they kept Sargent. They wanted to, you know, keep working with him and building him at that team. So I think it's really, really smart for that, for Williams to keep such a strong driver like Alex Albon to help with the car development. Next year will be our first real car from James Vowles or truly like he took over the team last year. This is his first real, real year, but not full of the development. So I feel like next year is really going to be the first true Val's car that we get personal belief whatever right at the end of the regulations right at the end of the regulations so I think it'll be really interesting to see where he takes the team into the next set of regulations he has been on a ton of really great teams he's led a ton of great teams he was at Mercedes forever under Toto um I love that he's a team principal I think he does a really good job and I'm really excited to see what he what he continues to do at Williams and I'm glad that he has a strong driver in Alex Albon to help him continue that journey and instead of it just being the Williams you know rookie after rookie after rookie so right like obviously Williams has been like a training ground for the last few years but you know Alex Alex Albon is a really good driver he has outdriven the car that he has been given pretty much every year since he's joined Williams obviously they've you know gotten off to a very rough start but to that that point, we're coming into round seven. We're only a quarter way through the season and Williams is known for developing, you know, a little bit slower. And, you know, I I think they'll get there this season. I mean, they won't be, they won't be great. They'll probably be the low end of the mid pack, but Albon will still have like really good moments. I think, you know, now that they don't have to focus on chassis replacement, we can focus on upgrades. (laughs) Um, also in Miami, did we talk, I don't know if we talked about this, but did you catch in the cool down room when they saw Sergeant's crash and the very first thing Max was like, do they have a spare chassis? <laughs> Where are they have <laughs> chassis? I yeah. Like, oh my God. Um, never, never forget the chassis debacle of 2024. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyways, big news for Alex. Very excited for him. Excited to see what Williams continues to bring always in his corner, always a big fan of him. And like Catherine said, he's, you know, has shown that he's a really strong driver. So well-deserved seat um, for the next few years. Also, I know we don't talk about rumors too much outside of our like fun, um, silly season uh, episode, speculations, but it is rumored that Sauber, which will be Audi, is going to re-sign Botas for one season to get them through the uh, end of the regulations but then like is it 
is he going to stay with Audi? I don't, I, the, the whole Audi Sauber thing to me is just weird. Um, but yeah, so it's rumored that Botas will be back for at least a season before it's like fully Audi's team. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. Um, and, you know, it kind of makes sense that they would stick with Botas. You know, for all that it's a shit car, he is the more experienced driver. I know that, you know, you and I both love Zhou Guan Yu and Zhou Guan Yu needs to have a seat on the grid somewhere. Um, but I... It it kind it's it's very interesting. It it makes you wonder if they're maybe waiting for somebody to be available for twenty six and just yeah holding on to him for twenty twenty five. The question is, could Botas get another deal elsewhere on the grid? I think the answer is is, is no. He he couldn't probably get a better offer from from anybody else. But I, I just think that the idea of holding on to to Botas till the end of the regulation is really interesting. I do too, for several reasons. I think like the Botas Hulk uh team. Oh, that would be thing such an interesting pairing. Interesting. But also I think it's so again, take a step back. I'm the the budget finance person. That's how I think of things. Botas and Joe Yu, yes, they're I mean, Botas is he doing a little bit better? Yes, but does it really matter? No. No. Right. So for the way that they're both currently driving with the current car that they have, Joe's the cheaper driver. Botas is more expensive than Joe. So if you're just doing one season to get you through the end of the regulation before Audi fully takes over, and Joe we know is bringing in more money than Botas, and if you know that you're not going to really move up in the constructors, why are you? Why the money to me doesn't add up if they keep Botas. Yeah, I mean, it might not be a question of money. This this also goes to the fact that, unfortunately, Joe has never been able to prove just how good of a driver he is because he's in the bright green turtle. Um, and so I, I really think that as, you know, he's the one who's going to be more likely to be screwed out of a seat than, you know, Botas would be because Botas does have all of his years of experience at Mercedes that he, and, you know, he's, he's, great at marketing um and he i think he's done wonders for for the marketability of this team like obviously bringing in in sponsors and bringing in like the the china money that joe brings in is huge um but you know i i also think that it's it's really just a question of how are they gonna get through the end of this current regulation and get themselves into audi and then you know audi takes over and everything's gonna be different yeah i guess i don't know to me it just like I get it, but it doesn't make sense. That's if fair. that makes sense. <laughs> but, yeah. oh my gosh. And now I just had a brain blast. I can't. I really hope that they keep this car green next year. And it's just like Hulk in it. And if he ever crashes, I'm just going to be like, Hulk smash. Hulk smash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm here for it. Gosh. I'm here for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So other news that we've had over the last week or so. Um, we've got some major Ferrari staff changes coming along. Um, they have two major hires from Mercedes. Um, Jerome D'Ambrosio has been hired as Ferrari's deputy team principal, so just under Fred Vasseur. Um, and Luis Serra has been hired as the head of chassis performance and engineering. Um, they are going to be, I, I don't know if they've already left Mercedes, but they will be starting in October at Ferrari. Um, Ambrosio, most notably, he was the head of Mercedes Young Driver Program. So this really speaks to, you know, growing more of that development um, in the young driver, you know, training portion of, you know, of Ferrari, which they don't really got a lot going there, really. I mean, they have Ollie Behrman, but they're going to lose Ollie Behrman out, out of the junior program technically soon because he'll get a seat probably at Haas. Um, but it's, it's, the the merry round of major players um who are not drivers mo- you know moving teams is always very fascinating um and then yeah i think before we get to the next one i just i yeah. always think it's interesting when these hires are made and i know everyone's thinking like oh they're poaching him because of lewis but if you think about it taking like your individual team out of the equation there's only nine other teams to go to right and if yeah. you're in the top half, 
you really only have two other teams you can poach to. So it's always going to be Red Bull, Mercedes, and Ferrari, maybe Aston Martin poaching from each other, and McLaren. Yeah, like, and top McLaren. Top half, let's say. But there's only 10 teams, there's, and there's only so many people who have experience doing what these people do. So I, I know it's news, and, like, people come out and they're like, oh, my gosh, this move, X, Y, Z. But it's like, naturally, this is going to happen. Like, in any other professional sports setting, a coach will go to another team, but there's just more teams in that league. This team only, or this league, for sake of the argument, there's only nine other right. places you can go to poach. But if you're in that top half, there's really only maybe what three, two that you can poach from. So it's just, yeah, I, exactly. really, I was really thinking about that when I saw these hires and it was like, oh my gosh, they're taking more from Mercedes, but other people are taking from uh, Ferrari. So it all just kind of cycles through. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a whole it's a whole merry-go-round, but yeah, I think this is this is big. I mean, deputy team principals is a huge position. That's a big and then, one to lose, though. Yeah. Well, he wasn't deputy team principal at Mercedes. He was the head of the young driver program at Mercedes. Um, so but he's no, that's going. What I'm saying, it's it's still like a big person. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To lose definitely, and then you know, running up their chassis performance engineering, which uh, will apparently be like he'll have his fingers in a bunch of different pots. Um, so those are are two really big roles within Ferrari that have been taken over. But then an, a, a bigger, more front facing role is Charles Leclerc has a new race engineer starting this weekend in Imola, which. Weird enough, this is the second time this season we've had a change in race engineer. Um, Valtteri Botas was surprised a couple of races ago with a new race engineer. Um, at least that's what it, that's what it struck me as um, in the the drivers' press conference that he he didn't have a say in it, nor was he told. Um, but he kind of played it off as it's you know part of the changes that they're making as they transition to Audi. Um, but Javi, we are checking Marcos is moving to a different role within the team. Um, and Brian Bozzi, who is currently Charles Leclerc's performance engineer, he will be taking over the role of race engineer uh, starting this weekend. Um, as somebody who's a little bit newer to Formula One and to the, you know, team, you know, race engineer driver dynamic, I was actually kind of surprised at the the reaction from, you know, other fans about this change. Um, and the impression that I got is a lot of Ferrari fans specifically were not exactly Javi's biggest fan. Well, okay, let's just take a beat to talk about Ferrari fans, though. Like, they will... I don't think they like anybody when they're not doing well. That is um, also true. So, yeah. I mean, again, someone who's newer to Formula One myself, like, the race engineers to me are basically just, like, their comms man, right? They're just relaying information and they're receiving information. So I think that really, like, I know there's way more to that and it's way more technical, but, like, in Emily's brain, that's what happens. And... Charles gets a little spicy on the radio, so I'm, yeah. I, like, to me, personally, I feel like it just wasn't meshing well, and he, they just need new blood, so just change it up. Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, it, it, it can't get worse, I mean, Leclerc's season has been decent this you know this this year um you know obviously he's he's really going head to head with Carlos Sainz his soon to be former teammate um but you know obviously Leclerc has struggled for a long time you know with you know Max converting most of his polls to victories um among other things so um i y- it, it can't get worse. We can, we, it can only get better from here. So hopefully yeah. this, this helps him improve and hopefully Bozzi brings in, you know, some, maybe some little different strategy insights so that we aren't going all the way down to plan X five laps into the race. But it's so much fun, Catherine. Oh, but it no, is so and, much fun. And I was like thinking about this change too. And also with Botas, it's well, Botas. And that's why I was thinking about it. Cause Botas was like a surprise to him. But I feel like this may have been a request from Charles, just like the way that they're going about it, because they're like, oh, yeah. we're just transitioning him into a different position. Like if he really sucked and Ferrari wanted to can him, like they would get rid of him and he wouldn't be on the team anymore. So to me, right. this seems like a personal request, whereas Botas's was like, I don't know what happened with Botas, but this seems Botas like Botas was request, a little bit of so. getting the, the floor yanked out from under him. <laughs> uh, classic. So yeah. something else to look for or not look for in Imola, 
um, is Crofty. So Crofty, one of our favorite Sky Sports presenters, is on a break for the first time ever since starting, uh, since Sky Sports took over F1. So Crofty's been at 100% of the broadcasts since 2012, or 2012, and 2012, Jesus, numbers, <laughs> time. Um, but yeah, so he's on a break. I'm so sad. Yeah, I, I'm sad, but also this is like some well-deserved time off. Like, you know, I knew that he had done a ton of races, oh, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. didn't realize that he had not missed a race in 12 years. That's wild. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like really a lot. Wild. Yeah, That's so many. So, um, so the fact that he's he's off for you know Imola and you know gets to watch Imola as a fan, um, and he'll also be off uh, later this year um, in Austria and in Baku. Um, it, it's it'll be different for us who have only known um, his his broadcasting, but we all have Harry Benjamin who's been with Sky Sports since 2021. Most notably, he's helped out on the kids cast last season. Yeah. Um, and I, I think he's good. I, I'm, I'm I here agree. for it. I don't, I don't have any, you know, concerns. No, <laughs> and this fine. seems to be like a, a theme with Sky Sports. They're really like Martin Brundle's on more breaks this uh was last year and this year he's taking more races off they're really trying to rotate their presenters get a good mix of different people and I think they've done a pretty good job with that I know you know we all struggle with some presenters but (laughs) we do in every sport so it's not a perfect formula but um I do see them bringing in you know younger blood and and new presenters and it's it's not like it's just happening to Crofty because it's been happening to to everybody. So yeah, and especially when you consider like the Formula One season, especially with 2020, 20, 24 races in twenty twenty four, like the Formula One is is like a nine month season, but it's a nine. It's not like a nine month season of. I don't know, hockey in the NHL, um, where like, that's all in the United States and Canada. Like this is all over the world. Like that's, that's a lot of travel. That's a lot of time away from home of, you know, and a lot of, of work and things that you have to do. So, you know, it makes sense that some people are going to get tired, like, you know, traveling with the international circus week in and week out. No, for sure. And especially, you know, being one of the main presenters, having to do all of that research and have all of that knowledge and do all of that prep. Like it, it does take time. It's not like they're just there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Like they do a lot of prep. They do a lot of um, work behind the scenes. So well-deserved. Well yeah, deserved. absolutely. Oh, and so to kind of get into our Italy bit here, we're going back to Imola. Yeah, we had a year off. So for those of you who are maybe new this season or don't follow Formula One consistently, um, Imola was canceled last year for horrible flooding in the area. Um, It was actually really, really bad. Yuki Tsunoda, um, there's a ton of pictures out there of him helping the cleanup efforts from the flooding. Um, So we have not actually raced in Imola since 2022. So we are finally back and Catherine you found a really funny fact about the last time we were in Imola yeah last time we were in Imola someone who was not named Max Verstappen was actually leading the driver's championship and also Red Bull was not leading the constructor's championship it was Charles Leclerc and Ferrari and like it it like thinking back to that season Max and Red Bull had a slower start. Um, they had some some reliability issues that they had to work through in those like first five races or so. Um, and so, yeah, Leclerc Leclerc was ahead. He he had been doing a little bit more of the winning. Um, but it's just it's so wild to think that a it's been so long, but b it hasn't really in the grand scheme of things been so long that you know Charles Leclerc was actually leading the championship. And Ferrari was actually leading constructors. <laughs> yeah, which is like we we you you don't remember that, especially because like 2023 was really not a great year for Ferrari for the most part. Um, but yeah, they and it was actually a good year for for McLaren. You know, Lando Lando was on the podium in Imola. Yeah, it's it was also a sprint weekend, but we don't have to talk about the sprint. 
there you go bringing up sprints again no it is always interesting to like look back at where we were at a year ago Mm -hmm. two years ago because two years is not a big jump and yeah life life was different back then yeah, it it was it was very different. We we did not we we did not see coming in 2022 just how dominant Max was going to become. Um especially, you know, this was early in 2022 right after the very tumultuous end of the 2021 season. Yeah. Wild. Well, for the 2024 season, let's uh let's do some in-depth discussion about that. So, but before we do, Catherine This is, I think that my favorite thing about Imola, besides the fact that we have two races in Italy, is the incredibly long, obnoxious, ridiculous, so unnecessary Grand Prix name. And Catherine loves saying it. So this weekend we have... The Formula One MSC Cruises Gran Premio del Made in Italy, Edel Emilia Romagna 2024. Yeah. Yeah. Or... Imola. Imola. (laughs) So this is the first of two home races for Ferrari because they claim both Imola and Monza as home races. And it's also technically V-Carb's home race as well. Um, They're based in Italy, so. They're based in Italy. They do claim it as their home race. People will argue about it, but it's technically their home race. Um, And we have a lot of changes coming this weekend. So I'll start with the upgrades first. So there are several upgrade packages or let's say second half of upgrade packages coming this weekend. So Aston Martin, Red Bull and Ferrari are all bringing not major game changing upgrades, but they are bringing upgrades for the season. Um, They've all kind of come out and said, you know, this is not. Well, they did say Aston Martin's upgrade package is going to be the big one. Right, 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 yeah, but it, but they, but didn't they say that they're continuing? They're going, they're still working on another upgrade package. Like it's not their final. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then Mercedes is bringing the second half of their upgrade package, and McLaren is bringing the rest of the upgrade package for Oscar Piastri's car. If, going back to Miami, Lando had the full package. Oscar had half, so now they're giving Oscar the other half. And then Sauber also allegedly is fixing their wheel nut issue. (laughs) So we also have that. So a good amount of upgrades this weekend. Personally, I'm really excited. I love seeing upgrades. I love seeing the cars get more competitive through the season. Um, It also makes predictions really, really hard. Especially when like last year, Aston Martin had their like, were great at the beginning of the season. Then they had their upgrades, but they were downgrades. And then that threw everything off. So um, very excited to see what this brings for all of these teams. Um, most notably, I think I'm excited to see Oscar with the the full package on the McLaren because he yeah, was driving yeah. really, really well last weekend. Or yeah, I guess last weekend in Miami um, with half of the package. So I'm excited to see what he brings for for the full thing. Yeah. And I also think I I forgot to put this in, but what's going to be really interesting um, is not only do we have upgrades, but we have rain in the forecast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know it's, it, it's going to be, it's going to be really, I think a very interesting weekend, especially when you bring in not only weather, but we also have track changes um, that, you know, we haven't been here in two years. They've, they've reprofiled a couple of things. Um, Turn nine, they've removed an asphalt runoff portion um and then turns 11 12 and 13 they've reduced the amount of runoff room that they have um and then turn 14 and 15 they've added in a gravel trap and we all know that gravel traps can cause some some chaos and some damage so it'll be so this is you know yes it's a it's a track that all that all of these drivers have some experience Mo, no not all of these drivers have experience on um but a, a decent amount of them do but at the same time this is still going to be different from what they last experienced um and you know they obviously have the the simulator um that give you know gives them a little bit of a, a head start on what the track is going to feel like but it's you know nothing's going to be like actually driving the track and fortunately we don't have to worry about the sprint race format and we have multiple practice sessions for them to get used to it yeah no I think I I mean taking a year off it's only a year but still it is a year off from the track and also with track changes I think it'll be interesting especially throwing weather in there Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, so you know, I'm going to take this back. Before we started recording, I was like, nothing seems exciting. You know, I just, I feel like it's just going to be another Max runs away with it weekend. And now that I'm sitting here and processing, it could be an absolute shit show. It, it could be, um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> TBD. I um, mean, even with, without the rain, I think that the, the upgrade packages are, are also going to lead to a, a ton of, of questions and, you know, will the upgrades be upgrades or will they be downgrades and how quickly are the drivers going to be able to get used to these upgrades? So I think that we're, we're going to have a lot of questions going into this weekend. Um, mm-hmm. and that could, you know, give us what we had in Miami and make things a little exciting and, and give us some, some more excitement this week. Cause I, I'm here for it. Yeah. Same, same, same. Um, another change to the lineup this weekend is young driver appearance by our man, Ollie Behrman. So he will be driving for Hulk um, in Haas in FP1. And if you're thinking, oh, is that the Ollie Behrman that already scored more points than some drivers this year? Yes, that is yep. the same Ollie Behrman. So he will get experience in a different car with Haas um, for FP1. And this is the second young driver appearance we have this season um v carb had a yumu iwasa 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 i you know me in pronunciation it's the worst um yeah. he drove for v carb in japan he's also a japanese driver which is kind of cool for them to have him um, appear for a young driver appearance um but yeah i'm excited to see ollie back on the track i really love ollie i think he's great good young driver super strong definitely a contender for a seat next season so it'll be nice to see him yeah I'm, I'm really excited to to see him a back in a formula one car b in in a Haas that he could that he's probably auditioning for um and as you mentioned he has more points than a number of, of drivers on the grid um i i wanted to look where he is in the standings now obviously he hasn't driven a formula one race a you know, that's not his job, but he hasn't driven since the second round in Saudi Arabia, where he finished P7 and got six points. That he still, he is still 12th in the driver's <laughs> championship. He's, um, he's even on points with Nico Hulkenberg, who also has six, um, but aggregate best finish. Ali is still ahead of him because he finished P7 and Hulk's best finish is P9. But he's ahead of Danny Ricardo, Esteban Ocon, and Kevin <laughs> Magnussen, who have all scored points. And then Alex Albon, Zhou Guan Yu, Pierre Gasly, Valtteri Botas, and Logan Sargent, who have not scored points yet this season. And that's just like, he hasn't driven since. He has one race. He's got one race. <laughs> and he's like, it has been fascinating to me since he drove, like how slowly he's moving down the the driver standings. Um, and you know, he more than likely he's only going to get this one race this season. Um, and he's yeah. still like really high up in the championship. Well, every single weekend it like shows the standings, and Logan Sargent's always twenty one, and I'm like, there's only twenty. Ah, oh, Ollie. Uh, Ollie, yes, <laughs> Ollie, yes, yeah, young Ollie. Oh, God bless. Well, you brought up Hulk. Yes. And so at the beginning of the season, we were talking about like records that, you know, are sad and need to be broken. Lando's was one of them. Podiums without a win, which was broken in Miami. Um, But one that we always keep our eye on, I feel like, and are bringing to the forefront. Um, Hulk now owns, as of Miami the Formula One record for most races without a win, which is 209 and counting because he still is racing and not retiring. So at the beginning of the season, I think we said like it's one to watch for that he could break and own. um, And he, he now owns that. that Yeah. And he's also on the verge of, from, from an, an entry standpoint the he's got two races away or three races from um most races without a podium um because the one thing that's interesting to to remember when you're thinking about 
records and, you know, Formula One records is for a time you could enter a race but not start because you enter and then not qualify based on the number of teams and number one dri- a number of drivers that were, were on the grid at the time. Um, so some, sometimes you'll, you'll get, you know, you know, driver's entries and driver starts won't match up. You know, Charles Leclerc has obviously entered races. And then last season there was a race where he did not start because he crashed on the formation lap because his car broke. Um, so, so that, so those you don't things. You have to bring up that as an example, Catherine. It was the first one off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, you know, poor, poor Hulk is just, you know, on the grid. He's got no wins. He's got no podiums, but somehow he keeps driving, which is, fascinating for the longevity of his career because he's really been around a while he took a couple years off um after leaving yeah. reno and then you know coming back to to haas but like <laughs> poor guy like we got to get him onto a podium at some point like at least let's give him that the thing is is that he can qualify well he he's made it to you know q3 several times this season and last season his car does not have long distance speed and if he stays in the Haas well I mean he's not going to but like staying in the Haas is not helping him so maybe his next team will will provide him that opportunity but it will also add more races for him to go before something happens also that yes yeah poor guy (laughs) well so yeah, so after this weekend, I'm guessing it's going to be 210 as of Imola, um, unless you know, cows fly. So you never that. know. It is, it is there. It could be raining, raining cats and dogs. Um, okay, so let's get into our Imola predictions, which is always fun for us. So for those of you keeping up with us, Catherine's currently in the lead, and I'm trailing. But it only takes one weekend to turn things around. So, and we don't have that many predictions this weekend because it's not a sprint Woo! We've had two sprints in a row. Okay, so we pick pole, podium, and P10. We award ourselves different points for different categories that we get correct. The first one we're picking is pole. So, Catherine, who do you have as your pole setter for Imola 2024? I think this is going to be the revenge of the max type of weekend um, as, as it tends to be after he does not win for whatever reason. So, I went with max yeah same i don't think i picked anyone else to get pulled besides max um i think you picked carlos once oh, one earlier weekend. this season i did yes you're right you are right you are right and i only remember okay. this because i there's a spreadsheet <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, and then podium. So again, we pick podium. We are picking on Wednesday night, so we don't get to see upgrades. We don't get to see anything. This is completely a shot in the dark. Um, and you have to get it perfectly, otherwise you get zero points. So Catherine, who is your podium for Imola 2024? My podium, like I said, Revenge of the Max. So I'm going with Max and P1. Um, Lando Norris is going to continue his run of, yay, really good, exciting. And he, I have him as P2. And then I have Carlos as P3 because I think that it's not going to be a sprint weekend. Oh, my God. Did we pick the same podium again? Uh-huh. <laughs> I had Charles in P3, but I was like, it's not a sprint weekend. Carlos, Carlos. is coming back. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I completely agree. Revenge of Max. I think he's going to get fastest lap. It, regardless of GP's, you know, guidance, um, I think he's going to get pole and I think he's going to win. Like, I think it's just, he's like, hey, Lando, happy for you, but Bye. Not, not anymore. Um, and then, yeah, Lando looked so good in Miami, but I just don't think he can fully keep up with the Red Bull. And with the upgrades coming for Ferrari. Dinner time. Dinner. Check. Um, where was my train of thought? Oh, yeah, with it not being a sprint weekend, I think Carlos is um, going to be on the podium, especially because Ferrari's car is supposed to be, like, a tenth faster or something like that. Yeah. So, we'll see. I, it's also fascinating okay. to me, just, like, the the real, like, Car- Carlos really does struggle on sprint weekends compared to a regular weekend, which is, like... Yeah. Obviously, you have a, a whole other race that you're contending with, which we talked about at nauseum in our sprint episode, but... The, the fact that Carlos really does struggle with these weekends is just very interesting to me. And like some people have those like little Achilles heels is, and it really seems like the spring weekends are Carlos. People have those appendices. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, he doesn't have one anymore, <laughs> but no, I think I, what I think 
is, again, my thoughts, it's probably wrong. He gets into a groove of like FP1, FP2, FP3, qualifying race. Like he has to get in the zone. And when you don't have that time to really like get in the zone and do your normal routine because you've got things going on every single session that are not nor like not normal. I know sprints are normal now, but I think it just throws him off a little bit. Throws, yeah. him off, throws it off a little bit. And for him to be like a top level performance athlete, like, yes, he should be able to handle it, but like. No one has a per- well. Besides taking Max Verstappen out of the equation, no one has like perfect weekends constantly. So, we'll right. get a break on sprints. Exactly. Okay. Last but not least is P10. P10 is the last position you get points on the grid. You get one point for P10. Catherine, who do you have as P10? If we get this, if we have the same person, I'm literally going to throw my phone across the room. <laughs> um. So I. I did these earlier and then I, ch- I actually did change my, my, my P10. Um, I, I originally was going to go with Daniel, but then I was like, every time I pick Daniel for P10, I jinx him. So I'm not going to go with Daniel. Um, so I have chosen Lance Stroll. Like, God damn it. God. Oh, but no. <laughs> Why are we I like literally, this? I literally, I can't zoom in. Wait a second. If I screenshot it, then I can zoom in. Wait, hold on. Everyone listening to the podcast, please hold. This is why you should <laughs> watch us on YouTube. This is why you should going watch us off on track YouTube. with Catherine and Emily. God. My lord, lordy, lord, lord. Why are we like this? We, you know, we tried. We tr- decided to turn this into like secret ballot type picks. Stroll. <laughs> um, be- because we kept picking the same pole podiums and P tens, and now we keep picking the same pole. Good. Maybe this goes to show that we didn't we had zero bias originally. Yeah. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah, apparently. We're just that good. Yeah. We're just that good. Oh, good lord. Okay. So biggest surprise of the weekend. So this does contradict my podium, but that's why it would be a surprise, right? So I have that for the first of two home races, Ferrari are going to be like vintage Ferrari and just go like one, two on the podium. And the the Tifosi are just going to burn the house down. Okay. Um, okay. Good to know. <laughs> My it's a big surprise. I mean, they're bringing up. Yes. Just. I'm thinking through this process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it makes make sense. Um, f- my biggest surprise is I think Alex Albon is going to have a rock star weekend riding high on his new contract. And he's going to, you know, get himself into the points. I love that for him. I do. Yeah. I, 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 I do. would li- I, I'd like to. I'd like to see that. Maybe I should have put Alex as my P10. Maybe that means Alex will be P9. Or P8. Or P8. Or higher. You can pick him for your podium. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, did that it. once. <laughs> Along with a lot of other people. A lot of I other people faith. picked him. I mean, he, he had a really, really good qualifying. No. That, that car was a rocket ship up until it wasn't. Um, R.I.P. Yeah. R. I. P. Okay. R. I. P. So last thing that we do for fun, uh, who is going to do a dumb this weekend, Catherine? So you said that Ferrari is going to go lights out. I knew it. I, knew I said it. that. How dare you? Well, I specifically said the that. Audacity. I, the audacity. In Italy. <laughs> in, in Italy, the audacity is I think that, you know, Charles and Bozzi are going to struggle a little bit with that driver engineer relationship. So I think that we're going to have a couple of ferrari hiccups with this transition to a new uh, race engineer what you say? so either you will be right or i will be right and we will see on sunday <laughs> or they're just gonna be like middle of the pack and it's be extremely like lackluster um, could be okay so i did spend a lot of time on this believe it or not and this is what i came up with but i would like to see just a good hard fought clean race we're coming back to Imola after you know tragedy last year it would be really great for it to just be not a perfect race but a race that is super entertaining super wonderful to watch you know all the fans are happy that it's back um so I have no one doing you don't that. have a dumb Ooh. I don't I know I have like we're gonna get some good good old f1 race in this weekend and everything not everything's gonna go perfect because you know someone has to finish p20 um but i think we're gonna have a a good solid weekend of racing 
Ooh, interesting. Um, really quick, speaking of no dumbs, um, F1, the FIA race direction are considering harsher penalties for people who drive yes. like Kevin Magnuson. Um, I forgot to add this in, but I did want to, to, to mention that. So, you know, I, I think that that type of aggressive type driving that Magnuson is known for might be something that's going to give him even more penalties than ever. Um, and I don't know, could get him to a race ban, um, which he's, he's got the, he's got 10 points. You need, you need 12 to get to a race ban, but right. that, that could be um, an interesting tweak if they decide to, to put that forward. I don't know if they're going to put that forward this, this weekend, but they could be, um, hammering down on those types of, of moves. I mean, I think that makes sense. Like we're always make every improvement that's made is for safety, you know, or not every, but most of them are done for safety reasons. Like the halo, the, the regulations on the cars, um, yeah. things like that. So we're only looking out for the safety of the drivers. So it makes sense. It yeah. Does. I mean, you know, his, his racing in the sprint was definitely different from his racing in, um, the race itself in Miami. Like yeah. the sprint was just flat out ruining Lewis Hamilton's day for fun. <laughs> um, and the, the, um, the regular Grand Prix was a little bit more aggressive than that. And I, th I think that there, yeah. there was a line there that might've been towed across. No, I, I can, I mean, I know in our recap episode, I was saying, like, I supported, like, just driving hard, but looking back and watching some of the footage, I, I do think he crossed a line maybe a little bit there. Yeah. So. Yeah. But all in all, I think this weekend we're going to have some good racing. I'm excited. Weather always, you know, causes some chaos, but um, hopefully we have a good race. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. As I the resident Ferrari fan. I, I am too. You know, Ferrari fans are next level, especially when they're happy. So, you know, they can be a little happy, but I still want Max to win. Of course you can. Of course. Well, that is all I have to say on Imola, but we do have your F1 fun fact. So Catherine, what's your F1 fun fact of the day for us? Yes. So um, I saw this on social media and wanted to look into it more, but um, 12 years ago, this, this past week, we had the Spanish Grand Prix in 2012, which was the first and only victory and also podium for everyone's favorite penalty getter, whose name isn't Esteban Ocon or Kevin Magnuson, Pastor Maldonado. Um, he won with Williams, which broke an eight-year race win drought, um, which... Williams is now in another race win drought because that's the, that's their last their last win, which is also just kind of hilarious. Um, but after the race, um, the garage caught fire. Oh, I saw this. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently what happened, something, and it hasn't really been made clear, but something happened with Bruno Senna's car. He's a Ayrton Senna's nephew um, that, you know, either they're like the fuel caught fire or part of the the car one of the car components caught fire but Valtteri Botas who was a reserve driver for Williams at the time he was in the garage when the car caught fire when it exploded um and there there were a couple injuries somebody did have to get airlifted with severe burns um Maldonado had to rescue his 12 year old cousin from the garage because his cousin had a broken foot. Um, and it was yeah. also the weekend that they were celebrating Frank Williams's, who he was the, the owner of the team and the longtime team principal. It was his 70th yeah. birthday that weekend. Um, so it was like a whole wild weekend for Williams 12 years oh, ago yeah. and just like fascinating. Never forget. Never, never forget that time that Maldonado won and is the only Venezuelan driver to win a Formula One race. And then immediately the garage exploded. Wild. Yeah. Absolutely wild. Well, a look back in time. Mm -hmm. Looking forward, though, we will have our Imola recap episode, which will be out on Monday after the race. We'll record that after the race on Sunday and then get it out for you guys on Monday, which I'm excited for. We have all day to record too, Catherine, because the race is early in the morning. <laughs> yep, I, I will be waking up very early, uh, and then probably taking a nap. This, I, I, we're 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 in. Catherine wakes up early to watch the race and take a nap. Season. 
<laughs> Yay, our favorite season. <laughs> All right, well, that has been our podcast for New Race and Emily this weekend. We will obviously keep you guys updated with everything on our socials. Make sure you like, subscribe, all of those good things going dot off dot track. And yeah, thanks for going off track with us, guys.